The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Dimensional Fund Advisors, ABN 46065 937 671, ASFL 238093, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. This series is brought to you by Dimensional Fund Advisors, a global leader in systematic investing. Since 1981, Dimensional has been applying financial science to investing and supporting financial professionals with time-tested solutions they can count on. The benefits of Dimensional investing can be accessed in a wide range of vehicles, from managed funds, to ETFs, to model portfolios. Dimensional works with financial professionals to deliver better results and help them grow successful, client-focused businesses through investment, client communication, and business strategy support. We call it Dimensional 360. Well, hello and welcome back to our second episode of the podcast. I'm joined here with David Swanick uh, from your morning in London, my evening here in Sydney. Uh, good morning and welcome. Thanks, Brendan. Great to be here. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, David, I would love to start with a, a little bit of background uh, of you, if we can. Uh, I understand you are the current head of communications for Dimensional for the EMEA region. Um, and vice president over there in London. Yeah, that's right. I've been working with Dimensional now for uh, over 12 years and uh, have been living in London all of that time as well. And uh, from this office here, we get to serve all of the UK, Ireland, continental Europe, and uh, a little bit of work in the Middle East and Africa as well. So it's uh, it's our little quarter of the planet. Brilliant, brilliant. And uh, with, a, with a title like this, you are exceptionally well placed to uh, talk to us about this episode's topic, uh, soft skills of communication. And that's something that I believe you're very passionate about. And I'm really looking forward to picking your brains on the topic. Yeah, I think it's a very important topic. It's something we take very seriously here at Dimensional. We've got whole bodies of work that you know we apply to the topic because we think it really moves the needle for, uh, for clients, uh, but also for advisors as well. I think it's one of those things where if we master communication, if we can do it in a way that's better and more effective, then it's one of those scenarios where everyone wins. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so David, can you take me back to the beginning? Can you tell me a little bit about um, your career and the work that's led you to where you are now? Sure. I, uh, like so many other people, I think I ended up in the financial services industry almost by accident. Uh, my my family background is is really one that's closely associated with banking. You know my. My father worked in a banking background, so did my mum. Uh, their parents each uh, had time in banking, so it was, you might think it was kind of preordained, but I went through school and university convinced I was going to do something different. But of course, when I came out the other side of university, I thought, well, actually, it's a pretty, it's a pretty good place to start. And so uh, that's really where I ended up in my very early career, uh, working in uh, general and commercial uh, banking. But at some stage in that journey with uh, one of the big banks, I discovered the advice arm of the bank and the investment arm. And, and, and that, for me, really sort of lit a fire in me because I could really see the meaning in the work around how you could help people plan for their futures and help families plan for their futures. Um, although I'd learned a lot on the other side of the bank, on the lending side of the bank, it, it, the advice and investment part felt like it had slightly more meaning because we weren't just providing a loan. It was we were providing the opportunity for a real future. So I kind of grabbed it with both hands and did my studies and became one of the first para planners in the banking structure. I mean, we're going back to the late '90s here, where this was, you know, more of a, a new yeah. concept. And then went through a series of roles, but it sort of ultimately led me to a place where I thought, well, this is a fine way to take uh, the the bank's products and find a way to get them to its customers. But I was kind of hankering for maybe something a little bit more independent, uh, maybe something a little bit more private. And so mm -hmm. in March of 2000, I decided that I was going to go out and see if there was independent businesses who were doing this and uh, managed to luck out by finding a fantastic little business in Brisbane 
called Elwood Barry McPherson, and you know this was a this was a small business doing really incredible things, and I was fortunate enough to join that firm, and uh, eventually become a partner. And Elwood Barry McPherson went on to be, become one of the founding partners of Shadforth, and uh, right. which which was produced out of this merger in two thousand and eight, and so it was a really interesting uh, journey through advice over over that decade or more. But along the way, I got introduced to Dimensional, really loved their thinking around investing and the way that they support financial advisors and had the opportunity to present at a couple of their conferences and really enjoyed it and uh, decided in the late 2000s that it might be interesting and perhaps I could have more impact if I was to join Dimensional and help other advisors make the breakthroughs around not only investing, but some of the other concepts that I now work in around client communication, around business strategy and practice management. And so I joined Dimensional here in London in 2011, and uh, uh, it's it's been a, a fantastic journey, and uh, certainly a, a great part of the world to live and and to work. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank thank you for the for the background, um, David. I, I'd I'd love to know was there a was there a light bulb moment for you when it comes to this topic of communication? I, I think it's probably fair to say that you know most advisors who are client facing have a personal sense that this is a really important part of our work. But for you, I, I think it's fair to say that maybe you, you sit a, a level above what most advisors experience in, uh, on this front. Um, where did that come from? Was there a particular client experience or was this something that just developed over time? Can you, can you tell me what this was like for you and why, why it's uh, become so central to your career? For me, I think it was the observation that despite all the study and despite all of the work and the technical aspects of financial planning and investing, there was nothing more satisfying than seeing the lights come on for a client when you explained a topic a certain way. And it mm. spurned in me what is now really an almost an unhealthy interest in all things communication related. You know, the study of communication is fascinating because we not only learn interesting technical and theoretical details about high quality communication, but there's so much room to explore also the practical nature of it as well. In the change of a word here and there, the way we might approach a topic by using a story or an analogy instead of just going straight to technical data is, is something that really has a profound effect on the end user of what it is that this profession does. The satisfying thing for me was seeing those lights come on and realizing that that was a moment where clients really understood, perhaps even for the first time in their life, a topic related to money, some some subtopic within money, and that in understanding it better, they felt more confident, they felt more comfortable, and they felt more in charge of their future. Let's face it, this industry is very technically focused and is very eager to get into the weeds of topics very quickly. Most of us, I think, get into financial advice because we've got a deep interest in trying to help other people. But sometimes what can happen is that our eagerness to help others means that we go straight to proving how knowledgeable we are and therefore we run the risk that maybe we end up getting into the weeds of technicality way sooner than we should or, or maybe we shouldn't even get into the technical details at all because we're so eager to prove what we know, we're so eager to help and yet we lose sight of the fact that we're talking to people who don't have an education around money. They're very successful people of course but they haven't specialized in, in, in topics related to investing and financial planning in the way that we have in the profession. So as we start to get into some of the, the technicality, as we start to get into some of the jargon, we run the risk that we're, we're losing people and we're not meeting them where they are. And effective client communication yeah. should instead be, I think, about uh, trying to package language in a way that is, is right for the end user more so than for us. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And, it, you know, even if it isn't the case that an advisor really wants to sort of show off what they know, it's it's probably fair to say that advisors are often cut from a similar cloth in that they have an interest in markets and they have an interest in strategy and they have an interest in how the mechanics of these things work. But you're right, that sets up the danger perhaps of uh, maybe assuming that everyone sees the world uh, in your through your eyes, yes, <laughs> or through, through your perspectives, and might be interested in the things that you're interested in, which, as we all know, is is just categorically not the case. Um, so, how 
what are some of the tools and things that have you that you found to be most effective in helping those light bulbs go on to use your your language what what are the things that you find advisors are uh, maybe miss the mark on most regularly or what can move the dial the most uh, to get those better outcomes and the extra kick in someone's communication style and presence and you know all, all of that what, what, what are there any commonalities what have you found I think one of the big breakthroughs is recognizing that communication, just like investing, can be a systematic pursuit. It's something that you can do with structure and with discipline. Perhaps people fall into the trap of thinking about communication as being fairly abstract and not easy to put a, a an organizing framework around, but I, I, I refute that. I, I think, in fact, that communication is something that can be done with a, a genuine architecture, a genuine structure, a genuine framework. And so... I've been thinking about this for over a decade. When I first arrived at Dimensional in London in 2011, my boss at the time, Sam Adams, said to me, well, you used to be a financial advisor. The The last talk at our introductory conference where we talked to financial advisors about what it is that we do is all about communicating these in principles to end investors, to end clients. And he said, well, you've been an advisor, so you, you're going to do that talk from now on. And I did what anyone else might do at the time. I spoke to the slides that were available to me and I muddled through those for a while, but it wasn't very satisfying. And so what then happened was I decided to go back and think to myself, well, what are the things that worked when I was an advisor? You know, what are the things that really were common to those moments where I did see the lights go on? And for me, it was some combination of focusing on certain words and phrases that seemed to react, uh, seemed to produce a positive reaction in clients. And so focusing on the, mm -hmm. the focusing on those words, but then avoiding uh, the other words that didn't seem to land well. You know, often that was technical jargon, by the way. So there was some focus on just the, the raw words that we used and making sure that we had a kind of a list of helpful words and phrases and a list of unhelpful words and phrases, focus on one and not the other. The second was, I seemed to notice that storytelling you, you used to work almost universally with clients. As soon as you moved into a storytelling mode, you could see people kind of lean in, maybe not physically, but you could almost see it motion, emotionally and mentally. Mentally, And that was a very positive thing. You know, the idea that storytelling just activates a certain emotion and a certain engagement in someone meant that it was definitely something I wanted to focus some more attention on. It likewise seemed to be the case that when I drew a diagram for someone, uh, that the visual picture helped turn complexity into a kind of simplicity that people could digest. And so I later learned that so many people in the world are visual learners and would much rather see something drawn so that they can organize it and digest it in their mind and break down this topic into something that's understandable to them. And then lastly, you know, wherever I could, I would reach for props that would help tell the story or help uh, bring something to life. I mean, at Dimensional, our, our chief prop is probably something like the, the Matrix book because it, it really helps summarize decades of market and asset class data into something that can be used in a conversation or told as a story very, very easily. You know, we like to say that it turns emotional conversations into rational conversations very quickly. And so as I thought about those four things, you know, the focus on the words and phrases, the use of storytelling, the drawing of diagrams, and the use of these props, it seemed logical to try and build some kind of system around this. So I gave them each a name that started with the same letter, happened to be S, and they became scripts, stories, sketches, and supplements. And so now for a decade, and in fact now globally, we uh, share this 4S framework with advisors and wealth managers uh, as a way of really scaling effective client communication and making it systematic. Because there are certain rules within each S that we like to follow. And if we can apply those, and if we can think about answering questions the right way, drawing diagrams and sketches the right way, and telling high quality stories that allow for natural rising and falling dramatic tension, then we know that we're moving the needle in terms of the quality and the effectiveness and the impact of our client communication. And uh, we know that we're helping the advisors that are needing to have those conversations with end clients as well. Yeah, that, that's excellent. And it's it, it's interesting that you you know assert that it's it can be uh, structured and strategic. Very because nice it's, it's often the case. I think. Yeah, people people don't feel like that. I, I think to do advisors who are uh, maybe earlier on in their careers and 
they will listen to an advisor with all you know a lot more experience uh, who might be a very good communicator or very good at explaining certain topics to clients. Yeah. And I, th- I get the sense to them it feels like some kind of dark art. Yes. <laughs> that you yes. just sort of need to absorb through osmosis over the next, you know, 10 years and just hope for the best. Or even so worse. What you're saying. Even worse, yeah. they believe it's some kind of innate natural ability that they'll never be able to inherit. And well, sure. uh, I reject yeah. that notion completely. I think this is definitely something that can be trained. And as much as we might look to those... Uh, those senior people in the industry who just seem to do it so effortlessly and elegantly, I think those principles are eminently teachable and things that we can absorb and start using over time. I'll give you a great example. You know, one of the most common forms of, of communication that we're going to experience in our life as advisors is in the form of having to answer a question from clients. I don't think anyone would argue with that point. And when you watch some of those luminaries of the industry that you talk about, Brendan, you know, we, we see them confidently sit back and just articulate a brilliant answer to a question that a client may be asking and often incidentally with some emotion because they come to this topic of investing with you know with huge emotions but when you break it down i believe chances are they're just doing some very basic things and applying a system even if they're unaware of it they're applying some kind of system to answering that question chances are firstly they're listening and paying really good attention to the person who's asking the question and letting them be heard letting them get to the end of their question, letting them get it all out. That is a deliberate and practicable skill. They're probably then acknowledging the fact that the question has been completed. They're acknowledging the question. They're acknowledging the person. Just basic things like saying, yep, I hear you. I understand what you're saying. They're very, very powerful, very simple, but very powerful because we're dignifying the person that's asking the question. Probably some kind of clarification there to say, you know, when I struck this conversation, with another client not too long ago, they sort of phrased it this way. Is that how you're feeling about this topic? And then in doing that, what we're doing is we're dignifying the question itself. And only then do we go into explanation where we say, well, here's how I'd answer the question or here's how I'd get you to think about it. Now, it turns out that that entire process of listening, acknowledging, clarifying, and then explaining is something that really sits within frameworks like the one that we've devised here in the 4S framework. We think about listening as being a key skill in effective client communication, but the system of acknowledgement, clarification, and explanation is a thing we call the ACE framework, and it sits within the scripts part of 4S. And we teach it as something that you can start to learn as a kind of an autonomic habit as you start to get questions in from clients. Question comes in, you say, yep, I understand. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Hey, look, I'm just as anxious as you are sometimes. I read the same news that you do. I watch the same programs or, yeah, I saw that commentary or I saw that latest economic data. What we're doing is we're putting ourselves on the same side of the table as our client. And only then do we say the uh, answer to the question. The the, the reason I kind of labor this point is that we're so eager to help because that's the reason we got into this profession is that so often we launch into explanation and we don't allow enough time for that other good stuff at the beginning, which is really... It's, it's really all of that spade work in turning the soil that then allows our explanation to truly flourish. A- absolutely. And I, I find also as well that dealing with, you know, advisors who are earlier in their career, w- w- one of the things that I like to try and point out to them is that if you do just fire away with an explanation and you haven't actually clarified that you're on the right track, you, you could go ahead and waste, you know, a good five, 10 minutes of a meeting addressing a question that might not actually even be there. That's right. If you don't take the time uh, and even as you're explaining something, just to check to see if you're on the right track and say, is this is this the point that you were getting at or is this what you were curious about? Is this, is this you know, resonating with what was on your mind? Th- those sorts of things. If you don't have that, even as you're going through the explanation, then the, the chances of you, you know, firing off on the wrong direction are pretty high. Yes, that's exactly right. And I think an important principle to remember is that when it comes to client meetings, it's their time. I mean, let's not even think of it as ours. It's their time. And we get so little of it. We get a handful of hours a year. And in those handful of hours, we are in competition with the thousands of hours that clients are not with us getting the benefit of our calming, sage erudition on all things money. And instead, we're competing with all of the noise that is out there in the marketplace, yeah. sometimes well-intentioned, sometimes not well-intentioned, trying to talk them into doing something different. So if we're chewing up someone else's time in a valuable meeting 
answering a question that's not been asked or not checking in along the way to see if we're really helping, then yeah, that that is kind of a it's kind of a rookie mistake. But it's not just for rookies. You see plenty of advisors out there who make these mistakes have been around for a very long time. So I come back to the idea that communication is a learnable discipline. It is something that we can do consciously and with good structure and with practice, you inevitably, having put the time and the energy into it, can get better and better and better. And you'll benefit and your clients will benefit and your business will benefit. I mean, it's, there's, there's not many things in the world where literally everyone wins, but I don't know, effective communication seems to be one of them. No, I think uh, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> Um, it, David, I, I know that you and the team did some work around uh, the attributes of uh, great advisors, and and I think communication was part of that. I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you found during that study, and uh, yeah, can you can you enlighten us on on the you know magic ingredients? Sure, sure. At Dimensional, we run two major studies annually. There's a global advisor study, and that's our study of the profession. It's a study of financial planning and wealth management firms, investment management firms all over the world. Close to a thousand firms a year take part and we get incredible detail on what's going on in the profession, what's going on in those businesses, their goals, their challenges, but also a lot of the metrics that I think make up the DNA of those businesses and we can study them in in pretty breathtaking detail. But it is only half the conversation. On the other side of the coin, we've got our global investor study. And that's a study of end investors of advisors who choose to do work with Dimensional. And we get close to 20,000 participants in that study every year, talking about all aspects of their relationship with their advisor, uh, how it is they'd like to receive client service, how many uh, times they'd like to interact with their advisor, the things that are important to them, even getting down to questions like, you know, what's the main way that you attach value to the relationship you have with your advisor? So there's some pretty interesting stuff in there. When it comes to communication, one of the things that we've observed that has shifted slightly over time, and I think largely related to the period of the global pandemic, is that now much more so than pre-pandemic, and incidentally, I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, clients are comfortable with the idea of receiving some of their client experience virtually. So whereas as advisors, I think we were very much in a mindset And in fact, our study data bore this out. When we asked advisors this question, when we asked end investors this question, it was absolutely the case that meetings had to be in person. And this is data going back pre-pandemic. And incidentally, they wanted to meet on average once or twice a year. That covered the vast majority of people. And we didn't see a lot of variation, incidentally, uh, between advisor and client relationships anywhere in the world. Post-pandemic, what we saw is that the relationship shifted a little bit. And all of a sudden, and as we've seen in the broader world, Clients were happy to start receiving some of their service experience virtually. Now, this presents interesting opportunities and challenges, first of all, because it means that all of a sudden we can potentially leverage uh, more clients because although we're not spending any uh, we're not spending any more or less time holding the, these interactions, there is something that is that weighs more heavily on a business needing to provide constant in-person service. So being able to do it virtually, we think ex- uh, extracted some economic advantages for everyone. And so maybe it creates a little bit more capacity in businesses. So that's positive. But it only works if we apply our virtual communication in a way that is as powerful as our in-person communication. What we still see all over the world is a lot of virtual experiences that are still probably a little bit subpar. You know, if you're going to be meeting with a client, if you've accepted that some of your model for service is going to be delivered virtually, having Zoom and, and Teams setups that are not ideal for that or don't emulate the experience that someone might feel in office. You know, spend the extra loot on a decent webcam. Spend the extra loot on a microphone that means your audio is going to come through more clearly. Maybe think about a little bit of lighting. Maybe think about, if the world is full of visual learners, being able to draw in a virtual environment, whether that's digitally, uh, through the various services that are available, or uh, as I've seen some do and I do myself when I'm using my home Zoom setup, have a flip chart behind you that's well lit, which means you can draw on paper and give off all the benefits of sketching, even though you're in a virtual environment. So I think that's one of the things that we've observed that's key around communication. In, in, in March of 2020, we all had to pivot pretty quickly. And so there were lots of people who uh, ended up in a situation where 
their office was the spare bedroom and the webcam was the one built into the laptop. But we're well past that point now. And I think it's up to all of us if we're going to adopt a part virtual service model to make sure that we have the equipment that does the right thing by our client and at least gives off some of the experience that a person might have by coming to see us in our office in person. So that's that's one of the things that we've noticed that has changed. The rest of it is remarkably similar. You know, when we ask the question, mm. uh, what's the primary way you attach value to the relationship with your advisor? You know, we've been asking that question in the Global Investor Study since 2016. The answer has always come back, a sense of security and peace of mind. Now, that's interesting because it says that our profession, this advice profession, should be focused on really the transformation of feelings and emotions. Now, for all of the concrete, technical, numeric thinkers out there, this is going to be sort of a heretical comment because it's tempting <laughs> as financial services professionals to believe that our technical knowledge and our understanding of uh, you know, retirement law, superannuation law and regulations and regression formula are our key value add. I mean, they're very important, but nothing is, is as important as transforming how someone feels. If they walk into a meeting with some kind of anxiety they've inherited from the outside world, but thanks to you and your communication, they walk out of the room feeling like they've got peace of mind, that is a client who is going to be loyal forever and is probably going to go and tell other people about that transformation. And communication is our single best way to create that transformative effect. So that's one of the things that hasn't changed. 2016, all the way through to the current study, that answer has always been the same. The other thing that's interesting is when in the Global Advisor study, we asked the question, how well can your employees all articulate the key messages and values and philosophies of your business? We see some really interesting results. It seems to us, while we can't say something definitive about it, there's something in there that says the more that your team members can universally, in their own language, but can universally articulate the key messages and values and philosophies of your business, the more it's likely to lead to really tangible commercial outcomes. Because that top wedge of, of businesses that we observed who say, guess what, all of our team members can do that, not just the client-facing staff, not just the ones who are interested in communication, but everybody from reception to chairman can do this. They're the ones that lose fewer clients, they grow assets faster, and they grow brand new client numbers faster than their next closest peer group. Now, we can't apply direct causation to all of this, but there's definitely something in there. So I think communication yeah, done properly has it. <laughs> real commercial output. I was going to say, I think, I think Dimensional set an exceptionally high bar around what's provable and what you describe as proof. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite sure that everybody else is happy to take that as a direct connection that <laughs> feels intuitive and makes the world of sense. Uh, so you can probably drop the caveats on that one. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll let you go through the keeper. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully no one on that stage picks it up and, uh, you know, says that you're, you're talking out of turn. Well, compliance or research, but, uh, yeah. All right. Happy to take that. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, it, David, I, I am always interested in, uh, the, the sort of personalities, uh, psychology side of you know, understanding clients and where they're coming from as a tool for communication and having an appreciation for what drives them and what motivates them. And I know in our practice, one of the things that's been exceptionally helpful is uh, a bit of research that was done quite some, some time ago now, uh, which broke apart uh, feelings and attitudes towards money into sort of nine high net worth personality types. Um, and I know we spent a fair bit of time making sure that we uh, can recognize those different uh, sort of clusters of behavior and, and, and approaches and thinking around money um, and tailoring the communication accordingly. I, I'd, I'd love to hear from you uh, as much as it's structured and what you respond with can be taught and developed in a very intentional way. Um, what are the sorts of things that you've seen have really helped sort of better unpack things from the client's uh, side of things to try and improve communication overall? Well, firstly, I think it's fantastic that you've delved into that kind of research because not all people are the same. And the more that we can start to appreciate some of those differences and tailor our communication, the better the outcome is likely to be. As I said earlier, we get a few precious hours with clients a year. And of the 8,760 hours in a total year, a normal year, 
it is just a ridiculously small fraction within which to create enormous change. And that means, in answer to your question, we need to be employing things like active listening. You know, I like to use the phrase, be busy listening. It's not a passive activity. So that we can learn more about who our clients are, about what their personality is like, about what it is that drives them, what are their goals, what are their challenges, what are their dreams, what are their fears. I think that speaks a little bit to the kinds of research that you've been delving into as well. But another great principle of effective communication is flexibility. We rail against the idea of rote paragraphs that are designed to have a kind of a magical effect on all people. You know, the worst of these, of course, is the elevator pitch, the idea that you walk into a fictional ground floor elevator with a complete stranger. And by the time you reach the equally fictional fifth floor, thanks to your elevator pitch, they've all of a sudden opened their lives and their wallets to you. It's, it's nonsense. Instead, and this is where I think your research query is so powerful, we need to recognize that people are different and we need to adopt a certain flexibility. So as much as we talk about structuring effective client communication, as, as much as we think about it being a systematic pursuit, as much as we think about it being something that is teachable and scalable, it's always with flexibility in mind. That's why in things like our scripting part of the 4S framework, we focus on certain words and phrases that, don't, that, that, that make sense, but the equal discipline of not paying attention to the words and phrases that haven't made sense to clients over time. In other words, it's like Lego. Everything's modular. The way that I explain something to you in our time together today is going to be different to a meeting that I might have this afternoon uh, or to an engagement that I may have sometime tomorrow with a different person in a different setting. It's always going to be that way. And so being flexible and being adaptable with our communication while still sticking to certain principles is really the cornerstone of effective client communication and making sure that we meet people where they are. Listening is a great first step to doing that and then having absorbed as much information as we can and asking really interesting, empathic, probing questions, we should be well set up to embark on the journey of effective client communication with that person than a scenario where we just bowl in and you know, sort of barge in and start talking, assuming all of that other knowledge, which of course we can't know without listening, without asking questions. Yeah, of course. And and if you had to pick a if you had to pick a tool, you know, there are there are millions of them out there. Uh, is there anything that you what tool would best help aid communication to to figure out where a client's coming from? You know, you, you mentioned a few things there before, you know, to know what their goals and objectives are. If you know that, is that a powerful thing? Or if you you knew their Myers Briggs profile, you know, <laughs> would that be the most powerful thing? Or if you knew their financial level of you know education, if you knew that they were highly financially educated and you could talk in more technical terms versus you know very little you know financial education, it, have you got a view about which of those things are most powerful? I mean, we could we'd love to have them all, but you know, what are the things that we really need to know about clients more to pack more punch when we when we respond? Well. I'll go back to something you said, and I, I think I think the answer to that question is, look, I'm greedy, and I do want it all. And what I mean by that is I would love to know how someone ticks by understanding more about their personality style. I would love to know more about the way that they learn. Are they auditory, kinesthetic, or visual learners? I would love to know more about their, their, their relationship with money, their history, their background with money. I would love to know more about their confidence about money now, their knowledge of markets, their challenges, their dreams, their goals. This is all tied together with one common thing, which I think is one of the most important in all of client communication. And it's the ability to ask really impactful, clever, open questions that get people talking. So if I was looking for one superpower that sits at the base of all of us and does allow you to have it all, it's the ability to ask those questions and the equal ability to sit back, absorb the information, record it, and not feel the need to jump in. You know, one of the best questions I think that we can ask in our profession is just three simple words. It's, and what else? Because often people get to a point and they feel a need to stop, either because they don't want to swamp us or they, well, for, for, look, for lots of reasons, let's not assume what all the reasons are, but just being able to ask that question, what else? Tell me more. That's interesting. What else have you got to say about that? The, the benefits are enormous because assuming we've actually got the time to do this exercise, it means that you are naturally going to get more and more information 
But a, a secondary benefit is that really for the person who's on the receiving end of this, it could be the most heard that they've ever felt in a long, long time because we're taking a genuine, authentic interest in understanding them more deeply. And so asking these kinds of questions, I think, is perhaps one of the most important things we can do in client communication. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I know for us, one of the one of those questions that is one of the golden golden eggs, if you like, or the, the magic keys is, is just to ask simply, what was life like growing up with money in your household? Mm. You know, that, that unlocks a really sort of fascinating perspective. Again, uh, and one that often isn't articulated because you know it's not as if you you know sit down with your with your partner and yeah you know, at, at night and the kids are in bed and you just sort of say hey you know what, what was it actually like you know you, yeah. it, it's not one of those things that gets that gets opened up frequently and yet it does explain a whole lot about what drives people and can give you a bit of a sense of where they've come from and all of those other things that help paint you that picture and start to work with more colors on the canvas so to speak I think that's very true, and I think the investment of all of that work up front in trying to understand the origin story of people and their money pays benefits down the track because another thing that we find is that when clients ask us questions, the question they're asking may not actually be the relevant one, that sometimes it's the question behind the question. And if we've done all of that spade work in trying to understand people at a deep level in advance, chances are we are now better positioned to uncover the question behind the question and not just help them superficially, but help get to the real uh, nugget of what it is that they're anxious about or trying to accomplish. And that's got to mean deeper relationships between advisors and clients. And I keep coming back to this notion, what do people with really deep, satisfying relationships with their advisors have? Well, an incredible sense of loyalty, because they would never dream of going and using someone else. But perhaps even better, what else are those people going to do? They're going to go out and tell other people just like them about the way that their advisor interacts with them and the way that they solve problems for them. That is not just about technical financial planning and investment management because people don't really yeah. come to advisors for that, I think. We're sort of financial physicians and financial psychologists in a way, it, it, which is an, perhaps an unusual way to describe the profession. But I also think it's a little, it, there, there's something that's accurate about that as well. And so it's, it's one of the reasons why communication becomes such a, key and central part of a successful advice and client relationship. Yeah, it, entirely by good luck rather than good management. I am majored in psychology in my undergraduate business degree, oh, and yeah. I now like to joke that I get more out of the psychology major than I do out of the business degree, but... <laughs> You've ended up in the right place. <laughs> Again, good good luck, not, not so much good management. Uh, but yeah, look, I think, I think that's right. You know, it, one other thing that I'd add that I think it gives or, or that it really benefits is, is it allows you to speak more directly into some of the issues I think that, that clients might be facing. So sometimes uh, as a professional, you know, you, you, you don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> you, you want to try and keep people happy, but sometimes people are categorically making bad decisions and it can be hard to you know, be, be forceful or be direct about that if you're not coming from a place that the client can recognize is is genuine and has been uh, nurtured by really good quality conversations. And if if you are stuck at that superficial level, I just can't, I can't uh, agree that you're going to have the same level of impactness or impactfulness as, a, as an advisor. You're just not. Yep. Um, compared to someone else who, who's really nurtured this ability. That's right. And it's what you're talking about is kind of the easy way out because the effect of it doesn't manifest instantly. You can have plenty of client relationships that have a superficial transactional feeling about them and, and not the depth that we're talking about by using effective client communication techniques. And it will work for a while and it's an easy way to do things. You know, you'll get the plan out, they'll sign up, they'll do all of those kinds of things, fine, fine, fine. But, you know, when things get challenging, when markets deliver results that are disappointing or unpleasant or whatever, or when there's some other aspect of life that a client really needs help with, the, the absence of all of that deep preparatory work is really going to come to the fore and is going to make the task that much more difficult for everyone, uh, for the client, 
because now they're having to form that deeper relationship while they're going through this deep challenge or through this deep anxiety, but also for the advisor as well. So it would not surprise you or anyone to hear that I say, just get going on this immediately. You know, make the decision that communication is something that you're going to get better at and substantially better. And that's a, a discipline and a pursuit that is worth investing the time uh, in training on and forming new and better habits because it's going to be terrific for you as an advisor and it's going to have a really transformational effect on on your end client as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, as a quick plug, I have seen you present, uh, David, on this 4S's framework. If you're listening to this podcast and you haven't been to uh, to one of those sessions, just find it in your calendar, go and email reception. I don't, I don't know. I don't care what it is. You, you should get there. It's a fantastic, a fantastic thing to go and get to. It will definitely level up your, your ability to communicate with clients for sure. Um, David, you, you mentioned... Uh, just in there around the the more turbulent times of rocky markets and and those more challenging things that will will come up uh, they'll yeah. come up at some point you may as well sort of start preparing for them are, are there any specific sort of tips or techniques that you found working in the face of anxiety because I think that's probably the one of the bigger challenges that we've got in dealing with clients' emotions. It's it's often about uncertainty or anxiety. Yep. I mean, it can, can be about greed and all sorts of other things too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd probably say, you know, fear and anxiety is a big one because it's about the future and it's always uncertain. So is there anything specific that you would say uh, really helps communication in, in the face of that challenge? Mm. Uh, you know, I'm I just listening to you before, you made a couple of really sort of nice sounding empathetic comments like, you know, I, I, I'm watching the same headlines that you are. And it just, just yeah. sort of feels, even as I'm, it just feels a little bit soothing. <laughs> I was wondering, is there bit, more? You, you, feel a little, go on. you feel a little bit less alone when we use phrases like that. It's deliberate. It's a deliberate use of scripting. It's a, it's a little phrase that I think is very powerful that an advisor can use with a client say, yep, I, I watch the same news that you do. Or... I've got. I, I have another client who's asked exactly this question. People feel al- that they're not so alone, because part of that anxiety mm. comes from having gone through an education system for between ten and twenty years that does a lot of good things, but is not really renowned for teaching people about how money works. You know, I can think of all sorts of classes I went to in primary and secondary school that taught me things that were very interesting and engaging, and I'm very grateful for it. But they're things I'm not finding a lot of use for out here in the real world. And what was missing was basic education about how money works, the building blocks of money, how to have a great relationship with money. So anxiety about money comes from that place, together with the fact that we are emotional creatures and we are prone to some kind of awfulizing of things that we see. And we make sometimes unreasonable connections between something that happens over here and therefore what that might mean for something over there. So we see a news event on a geopolitical event or a market event or some economic data, some natural disaster, and we quickly infer that that must mean something for our investment program and therefore we need to get in and, and, and change it, which of course, as we know, is almost always not the case. So this anxiety is real. Partly it's, a com- partly it's solved by turning complexity into simplicity. Because all of a sudden, with simplicity, people have the the raw building blocks to work with a topic themselves and go, oh, actually, now I understand. Hey, I can see. Good, helpful. That's one of the reasons why our Matrix book is so good, because it really gets that simplicity out very, very quickly and through numbers which, which don't lie. But the other thing that we can do to help people with anxiety is to realize that they're not alone. When we, mm. when we in our global investor study... I have asked the question over multiple years, what's the primary reason you chose the advisor that you work with? The answer that keeps coming back at the top of the list is experience with clients like me. People want to know that they're not alone. They want to know that you've dealt with this before. So when, as as part of the work in scripting in the forest framework, we say, well, yeah, I understand how you feel. In fact, you know what? I had a client ask me exactly the same question last week, or yeah, I've heard this one a lot, actually. Uh, we, I had to deal with this in a meeting just this morning. And here's what I told that client, and they found it really helpful. 
or the the use of language that invokes some permissioning. You know, when I got asked that question last week from a client, I found that there was a little sketch that I drew for them that really helped put their mind at ease. Do you think that'd be a good use of a couple of minutes? I mean, what's the answer almost always going to be? It's almost always going to be, yes, please, because I want to be helped. It's great that someone else has felt this way and that your explanation and your answer ended up reducing their anxiety and it's probably going to have the same effect for me. And for the advisor, of course, it's a it's a little statement that your time is precious. precious. Do I have your permission to use a couple of minutes of your precious time to draw a diagram? Again, I think it's another way of using language in a way where everyone benefits. Yeah, that, that sounds a whole lot better than starting to sketch out a, a, a uh, yield curve and trying to explain why bonds had it, you know. <laughs> uh, well, you know, there's a time and a place, but yeah. I think uh, I think when it comes to yield curves, it's going to be pretty infrequent that you're needing to draw that sketch out. Yes, yeah. We, we like to joke in the office that, you know, if, you, if you're drawing the yield curve, you, you're probably off the mark for, yeah. uh, for 90% of clients. This was 10% of my mother. But, yeah, that's right. For ninety percent, you're probably off track. Yeah, <laughs> I'd agree with that. that. That's really that's really helpful. Thank you, David. I, I I like those I like those comments. And you're right. Just those little subtleties um, can can help a lot. Um, I'm I wonder if you are a general advocate for a recording client meetings uh, as as a practice ground to to listen to yourself back and to you know hear yourself and hear how you've explained things to try and improve is is that something you generally recommend recordings are, are tricky because of the privacy regulations around the world uh, client attitudes to it people seem to fit firmly into two camps in the client side either they understand the reasons why you're recording a meeting and are supportive of it but it seems to me there's just as powerful a camp that says I don't like being recorded or it's going to be somehow get into the wrong hands or misused. So it's it's a very tricky one. But more generally, I am a big fan of people recording themselves in order to improve their client communication. So when I say people, I mean advisors. You just need to yeah. probably pick your setting. If you've got clients who are happy to have their meetings recorded, then there's probably nothing better because it's a live interaction. You're getting the benefit of that end, cl- end client uh, re- reaction uh, in, in real time, which is good and you can hear. Video, I think, is even more powerful because you can pick up all of the non-verbal aspects of communication that can also be potential grounds for improvement as well. You know, whether we're folding our arms, leaning back, leaning forward, are we too casual? Are we too stiff in our body language? How often do we move? What's our client doing when we say certain things? What's their body language? Because they will give you a reaction. And... uh, You know, in a world where all communication is an exercise in persuasion, then there's lots of subtleties that are going on. So video is very powerful. We just have to recognize that it may not be possible to always do that with clients. So one of the things that we teach through our workshops is the idea of setting up regular role plays, you know, making time to uh, step aside with a client and say, let's just run this interaction and see how it sounds, or let's video this and imagine it's a real client scenario. If you're not in a world where you can do this directly with clients and and be recorded, then that I think is a discipline that everyone should be partaking in. The only caveat that I would add, and I don't want to discourage anyone, is something of a guarantee. Now, this should excite everyone on the podcast because here you are hearing from someone at an investment manager who's about to give you a guarantee. I mean, this is unheard of, but I'll give you this guarantee. If you record yourself in audio or video format, and if you play it back to yourself, I guarantee you will hate it. It is one of the worst experiences to listen to yourself or to watch yourself back. However, it's also probably one of the most effective ways to improve your tradecraft in communication because you will see all of those little things that you say or do that you think, I'd like to do more of that or I'd like to do less of that. So it's the best way. And we all carry around smartphones now. So certainly in the role play scenario with your colleagues, there's very few reasons, very few excuses not to do this. Clients a little trickier. But if you can do it, fantastic. Excellent. Excellent. David, I'm conscious of time and we've been having a, a fabulous conversation for, for quite a while now. Um, as we sort of land this plane, uh, I'd love to hear any any sort of closing remarks or thoughts or, or in, encouragements uh, for, for the advisors listening in their individual journeys of becoming better communicators. Uh, is there anything that you would like to... Uh, leave our audience uh, as we as we wrap this up. 
Well, I think the fact that people are listening to the podcast is just such a, a great first encouraging sign. And I just get people to remember this, that think back to the earliest reasons you got into this profession in the first place. And chances are it wasn't so much about the paycheck as the prospect of being able to help people who are unable to help themselves, who are frightened about their relationship with money, frightened about their future, and who are desperately seeking the distillation of all of this complexity into something that is simple and understandable so that they can take charge of their lives, move forward, sweep their challenges out of the way and accomplish their dreams. And all I would say is that, you know, despite the fact that I'm probably unusually passionate about the topic, let's let's none of us forget just how powerful and transformative client communication can really be. I think it can be the absolute difference between a successful and an unsuccessful client relationship, but also a successful or an unsuccessful uh, planning relationship with that client as well. Because co- client communication is one of the things that is going to get people to make high quality decisions. Effective client communication is going to be one of the things that keeps people in their seats as markets inevitably deliver their various uh, vicissitudes, their ups and downs across time. And so my encouragement to everyone is let's remember why we got into this job in the first place and never forget that client communication is probably going to be one of the most powerful and transformative and positive tools that we can deploy in not just helping ourselves, but acting on that reason we got into the job in the first place, which is helping other people. That's a brilliant spot to end on, David. Thank you so much for sharing your your time and your wisdom with us. Uh, We appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Brendan. Great to be here. See you again.